Okay, then welcome everyone. Uh, good morning uh, to the first session uh, of this uh, workshop today. And uh, the first speaker will be Kirill Stengel from the University of California at Riverside. And it's a pleasure to have him. Uh, we tried to get him to Bangalore, but unfortunately it didn't work out this time, but hopefully next time. Uh, so he's going to talk about order by disorder in classical Kagome antiferromagnets with chiral interactions. And I'm sure it'll be a very exciting talk. So I look forward and all of us look forward to your uh, talk, Kirill. So it's over to you now. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's my pleasure. It's also a real shame that I couldn't make it to Bangalore this time. Uh, I was indeed uh, hoping that I would be giving this talk in person, but unfortunately it didn't work out. So anyway, I've already wasted five minutes of my time trying to uh, set up the slides. So uh, let me... Uh, not delay the actual talk any further. So I would like to tell you the story that uh, was done over a couple of years in collaboration with my then student uh, at UC Riverside, Jackson Pitts, and um, also with uh, um, Finn Lasse Bussen, uh, who is now uh, at the University of Toronto doing his postdoc, who was a graduate student with Simon Trebst in Cologne, and it so happened that Simon Trebs gave him basically the same problem that I gave Jackson Pitts. Um, and um, I was visiting Simon and uh, we talked and it turned out that basically our students were uh, doing very, very similar uh, problems. And so it, it made sense to join our forces. And uh, in the meantime, I also visited uh, MPI PKS at the Mark Planck Institute in Dresden, uh, where I talked a lot to Roderick Mersner, who is also a part of this collaboration. And uh, the paper has been accepted and about to appear in PI research. So uh, what I'm going to tell you, uh, assuming I can turn the, I can succeed in turning the slides, is something about chiral interactions on a Kagome lattice. And uh, what do I mean by chiral interactions? Well, the chiral term in the Hamiltonian is given by this um, a mixed product of three spins. And uh, just to remind you, we had, so for the, for the rest of this talk, I will be talking about classical spins or semi-classical spins. So you should just think of, about them as, as uh, classical vectors for now. Uh, but uh, whether they're classical or quantum, uh, we can look at the symmetries of this Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian clearly breaks time reversal uh, symmetry uh, because time reversal is flipping the signs of all spins and uh, that just changes the sign of this term. Uh, on the other hand, this term is SU2 symmetric and uh, at least uh, at a classical level, it's really easy to understand because what this term is classically is just the volume uh, that is uh, the volume of the parallel pipe that is spanned by the three spins. And so, of course, being a volume, that quantity is uh, independent of your choice of the coordinate axis. And so that means that uh, this term is rotationally symmetric. Uh, now, um, it requires, or at least it naturally um, may come about in a lattice that has triangles. Well, you know, you don't have to have triangles per se, but you need to uh, define triples of spins. And if you have triangles, so that's natural. And a Kagome lattice is precisely the lattice with uh, lots and lots of triangles. And these triangles are corner sharing, which is an important feature of the Kagome lattice. And uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's, if you wish, it's defining feature is that it uh, consists of corner sharing triangles. And of course, uh, you by now know very well that it's a felt, fertile playground for uh, various frustrated phenomena. And uh, on the off chance you haven't seen it, that's the actual Kagome, which is a Japanese basket weaving pattern. Uh, and that's where the name came from. Uh, so now, uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, a frustrated Hamiltonian, but, uh, or a frustrated lattice. And it's worth pausing for a second and thinking about what we actually mean by frustration. And so uh, when people, Think about this, they often mention a Kagome, um, oh, oh, not necessarily Kagome, but uh, Heisenberg antiferromagnet. And if you try to put this Hamiltonian on a lattice with triangles, you see that all bonds cannot be satisfied uh, simultaneously, but whether or not you want to call it frustration kind of depends on your definition of this term. 
Uh, because what you can do is you can rewrite this Hamiltonian as just the sum over all triangles of the lattice of the total spin of a triangle squared. So uh, you can see that you can actually satisfy every triangle, um, or at least to the best of, uh, well, it's, you know, it's not making all spins anti-parallel, but this is the best you can do is if you can arrange every triangle in a configuration where the three spins of a triangle add to zero. And so now if you think about uh, trying to arrange these um, spins uh, on, on a triangular lattice, you see that you can do it in a single triangle, but then uh, once you've done this, you fill the rest of the lattice because your hand is forced. Uh, since every triangle shares two spins with the other triangles and you have the condition that all three spins must add to zero, uh, once you have chosen the three spins on a single triangle, uh, you've covered the entire lattice uh, if, you, if you're looking at a ground state. So you still have the global rotational symmetry of these three spins of a triangle, but that's it. Uh, you don't really have much freedom. And so I wouldn't call this a frustrated state because you really kind of locked yourself to a unique ground state up to a global rotation of the three spins with, with which you uh, started. Uh, contrast that with the Kagome lattice. So you can do the same with a, um, with a single triangle, but then if you try to do it for the next triangle, well, you can do that or you can do that. And in fact, uh, so even with the next triangle, you still have a freedom, even if you want to keep these spins in the same plane, as it turns out you don't, but uh, you, you can find out that there are many ways of actually satisfying these conditions. Um, by the condition, I mean um, that the total spin of, uh, of, um, of each triangle is zero. And there is no unique state that can do. And even if you look at the pattern that I have in front of you, you can see that it has no particular order because all triangles look different. There is no period to this. So it's, uh, there are many, 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 many ways, uh, well, an infinite number of ways in which you can do that. Um, and if you focus on the, only on the configurations where the spins lie in the same plane, and as I said, they don't have to, and I'll come back to that, uh, but if you focus on the configurations where all spin lies in the same plane, uh, you see that basically you can uh, stop drawing uh, arrows and just start marking the sites uh, with colors because uh, there is basically a notation that tells you uh, how, to, um, how to convert uh, colors to directions of spins. And so you can just keep colors if you wish. Uh, this will be handy for me when I talk about the chiral Hamiltonian, so just get used to it for now. Uh, now, as I mentioned, there are exponentially many states. Uh, there is also something very interesting, and that is there, there are so-called weather vane modes that will play an important role in what I will uh, tell you. And so what are these uh, weather vane modes? Uh, these are the modes that take one ground state into another and they cost no energy. And so the way to visualize this is to imagine a, um, I'm not sure you can see this, but uh, hopefully you can see the yellow line uh, on a slide. And that is a line that is drawn through the sides that contain spins of two colors. So uh, if you look at the colors along this line, it's only green and blue, uh, no reds. Uh, on the other hand, it's surrounded. All neighbors of that line are red spins. And so what you can do is you can simply take the blue and green spins and rotate them simultaneously around the direction of the red spin as shown here. I'm not sure why it came out to be uh, um, a little bit fuzzy, but the idea is that you just perform a rotation of uh, blue and green spins around the red and you can do it by an arbitrary angle and uh, here is the result of that. Uh, and, but you can check that the nets, the total spin of each triangle is still zero. And so it's still a ground state. So this rotation can be performed by an arbitrary angle and it costs no energy because it's just another ground state. Uh, now it's called weather vane because that's what weather vanes are. These are the, uh, uh, these objects that are freely rotate in the wind 
Uh, here is a slightly more optimistic one. But anyway, uh, so that's where the name came from. Uh, now, uh, one one thing that I should mention, uh, it's an ugly picture at this point, uh, and that is if you perform this weather vane rotation by pi, uh, that is by 180 degrees, you just replace. So let me go actually back up. Uh, oh, that's ugly. Uh, sorry. Uh, so if we think about the weather vane mode, and if you perform this rotation by pi, then you just replace uh, greens and uh, blue spins along this uh, this yellow line. And so that would get you from one state where all spins lie in the same plane to another in-plane state or coplanar state. So uh, we've seen these slides, so I'll just skip them. Uh, so there are many coplanar states, but two of them are actually so play an important role and they're kind of famous in this uh, Kagome business. Uh, one of them is so-called Q equals zero state that you see on the right. And it's called Q equals zero because if you stare at the state, and once again, I'm not drawing arrows anymore. So uh, if you wish, there is a uh, letter labeling or color labeling of the directions of spins. But the important thing here is that, for example, all upward looking triangles look exactly the same. So they all have A, B, C in that order. Uh, around every triangle. And so basically this is the state with the least magnetic unit cell because you just reproduce this upward looking triangle throughout the entire lattice and you're done. Uh, on the other hand, there is another prominent coplanar state and that one is known as root three by root three. And it also refers to the uh, Q to the, uh, to the unit vector of um, or the translation vector that corresponds to this uh, particular pattern. Uh, what is special about this pattern is now you can check that, for example, upward looking triangles look differently. Uh, you know, you can just trace three neighboring triangles and you see that they're all different. But what is special about this state is that if you stare at any hexagon of the lattice, you see that a hexagon now involves spins of only two colors, whereas in Q equals zero state, every hexagon involves three colors. Now, why is this important? This is important because I mentioned that the weather vane modes are the modes that you construct by basically tracing a line, tracing a loop with the spins that are of two colors only. So in a root three by root three state, uh, such loops are basically any hexagon. It only has two colors, and so it can uh, contain a weather vane mode. So you can just take spins around a single hexagon and rotate them by an arbitrary angle around the spins of type A, for example, if we're talking about this. On the other hand, if you try to play the same game here, it wouldn't work. Uh, in fact, the only weather vane modes that you can imagine would be along the lines of spin that span the entire sample. So. Uh, just to return this, the root three by root three state has the shortest possible weather vane modes, and it has the, the largest number of them. So it has an exponentially, or uh, I should say, an extensive number of weather vane modes in a crystal. On the other hand, the Q equals zero state has the longest possible modes because each of them uh, spans the entire uh, lattice and, well, you know, it's, it's a linear mode, but uh, their number is clearly sub-extensive. So it only scales as a perimeter of your system and not as the area. Uh, so now uh, there is one really interesting, uh, so you naively would expect that um, the thermodynamics at low temperature, I never mentioned what order by disorder is, and it's probably uh, something that I should have mentioned earlier, but the Order by disorder is a very interesting uh, piece of physics, which tells you that if you have many, many degenerate ground states, then uh, if you increase the temperature slightly from zero, so at zero temperature, all you care about is ground states, and there is absolutely no way to uh, tell them apart, to discriminate between them. However, if you increase the temperature, suddenly you start caring about the entropy uh, because what you're really trying to minimize is free energy, not energy. And um, 
the entropy associated with the low-lying excited state matters. And so the state that has more low-lying excited states around it uh, wins. And that's, um, so you suddenly have a discrimination between um, ground states that otherwise would have the same classical energy. Uh, there is also quantum order by disorder, which does the same thing, but uh, it's quantum fluctuations and not classical thermal fluctuations that, uh, that provide this selection. So here you would naively think that the, uh, since uh, there is a large number of weather vane modes in the root three by root three state, and there is a much smaller number in Q will zero state, then um, you would naively think that the root three by root three state would win by this logic. Uh, an interesting and somewhat surprising result uh, from the early 90s, uh, largely uh, from these uh, four seminal papers, uh, says that actually your intuition is not exactly correct. And if you only do the harmonic analysis of the fluctuation, it turns out that all coplanar states come on the same footing because what I was just telling you about is not really excitations. What I was telling you about were weather vane modes, which are free, these are not excitations, this is just different ground states. But if you start looking at the excitations and start looking at them in harmonic order, it turns out that all of these coplanar states are the same. But the important thing is that the coplanar states are beneficial from the point of view of the excitations comparing to the states where you allow spins to point out of planes in various random. So there are still ground states where the spins don't lie in the same plane. But so the important piece of physics is that the coplanar states win. Um, and in fact, uh, the first of these papers, so the first in the way I listed them by Choker, Holtzworth, and Schender, provided a nice numerical proof of that. And what they did is they looked at the specific heat per spin uh, that you can expect. And it turns out that um, there is one uh, harmonically soft mode uh, that is one mode whose uh, excitation energy is not quadratic, but rather quartic in displacement uh, per hexagon of the Kagome lattice. And that is uh, irrespective of which coplanar state you are in, but it's only for the coplanar states. Uh, but if that is the case, then you can just do a calculation of how much specific heat uh, per spin you expect based on purely, uh, it's basically the equipartition theorem. So it's one half of KB uh, per degree of freedom, you have three spins per, uh, uh, per, per unit cell. So that would be six times one half, uh, except uh, one soft mode per hexagon. And a hexagon contains basically three spins rather than six spins because each spin is shared between two hexagons. So we have to divide that by two. Uh, except, as I mentioned, one of these modes is not harmonic, it's actually quartic in displacement. And so you only have five harmonic modes, that's five times a half plus a quarter. And then if you divide it by three to convert it uh, to the specific heat per spin, you get instead of one, as you would sort of naively expect in a completely disordered state, you only get 11, 12. And uh, the uh, Monte Carlo simulations that they were able to perform back in the 90s, appreciate this fact, showed that indeed at very low temperatures, so this is the line uh, that you're looking at. So the specific heat kind of grows as the temperature drops, almost hits one. So that's sort of the maximally disordered state if you wish. And then it drops to 11, 12 at a temperature that is of order, uh, let's say, uh, so it's of order of one, uh, so, we, I mean, yeah, you can see the MG scales T over J. So this is an extremely low temperature. Uh, and that's the onset of the physics of order by disorder. And it's, so the, the, the big, so this phenomenon is only observed below one tenth of, uh, uh, of, 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 of the coupling constant at the temperature one tenth of the coupling constants. So now uh, there is actually, if you want to go beyond the uh, quartic order, there is uh, some evidence uh, by uh, J.W. Chern and Roderick Mersner that uh, beyond that the root three by root three state 
still wins. So your intuition would not be exactly wrong, but at least it's wrong in the harmonic order. Now, uh, the Hamiltonian of my interest, and that is of our interest, and that's the Hamiltonian that contains these uh, chiral interactions um, rather than Heisenberg interactions. But we can also mix Heisenberg interactions uh, to it if you wish. So we can parameterize the Hamiltonian by this parameter lambda that uh, tells you, so if lambda is equal to one or minus one, um, you have only chiral interactions. And the difference between lambda equals one and lambda equals minus one is whether the uh, chiral interactions on the upward looking triangles and downward looking triangles have the same sign or opposite signs. On the other hand, if you take lambda equals zero, then both chiral terms die uh, for the upward and downward looking triangles. And you only, you're only left with the, uh, uh, with the Heisenberg uh, term. And so this nicely allows you to connect the chiral Hamiltonian to the Heisenberg uh, Hamiltonian, if you wish. Uh, but let's focus on the purely chiral case. And it turns out, uh, so if we focus on the purely chiral case, so that is you're trying to uh, extremize these terms, the chiral terms. How do you extremize the, uh, the volume that is spent by the three spins? Well, you make them all orthogonal to one another. And so in other words, you make these spins to kind of form a coordinate, a uh, Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, and which makes you think that once again, you can uh, call them, let's say X, Y, and Z. Uh, and you can even envision, and so, you know, replace X, Y, and Z by three colors. And so you are back to very similar pictures that you've seen for the Kagome case. And that is uh, um, sort of these pictures, for example, of root three by root three of Q equals zero state. So it seems like the physics must be extremely similar except it's not. And the reason why it's not is because uh, these terms come with a sign. Uh, and so um, the chirality of the three axes can be left or right. And so this term, even if you extremize its value, can come with a positive or a negative sign. And so you have to watch for this. For example, if lambda is equal to plus one, that's all uh, triangles, now would like to have the right-handed triads of spins because they must have the same uh, chirality uh, for each triangle. And so I, for example, uh, have shown a picture uh, of how to assign the, so now, so now there is a Z2 degree of freedom that in addition to the color lives on every triangle. And that is where the particular spin points along the positive or negative x-axis or positive or negative y-axis and so on. And so not only you have to pay attention to the colors, you have to pay attention to the signs. And you see that, for example, if I try to do the root three by root three state in a uh, state with, with a uniform chirality, that is lambda equals to plus one, I cannot have all, uh, all signs to be plus signs because I'll just uh, run into a problem because this is the uh, right-handed triangle, but if these were all plus sign, that would be a left-handed triangle, and I want all of them to be right-handed. So I have to play with the signs. Of course, I can arrange that, um, but uh, we'll go back to that in a second. So I also want to point out something. I can pick any line, and that line goes through sort of any arbitrary colors and just simply flip this side. So this is not a weather way in mode, what I'm doing now, because there are no continuous rotations that I'm talking about. I'm just allowing to flip the signs. If I flip the signs along a particular line, a particular loop, I preserve the ground state nature of what, I, uh, of what I'm doing, because every triangle is either not touched by that line at all, or two of its spins are uh, involved in that. And so if I do that, so I should mention that the line is not allowed to have sharp corners. So it's either straight or, or obtuse angles. Uh, and if that is the case, then uh, flipping two sides of a triangle preserves, of course, the, um, the handedness of, of a particular triad of spins. So this is one way of getting from one ground state to another that only involves this new Z2 degree of freedom that wasn't there for the Kagome antiferromagnet. 
Uh, now, the important, the, the important fact here is that for any three color arrangement, there are exactly the same numbers of possible Z2 arrangements. Um, in fact, it's two to the N where N is the number of unit cells or the number of uh, hexagons in the lattice. And that different uh, Z2 assignments uh, generally would result in different semi-classical equations of motion, even though the classical energy is the same. So if you want to go into, uh, into the semi-classical physics, uh, interested in quantum fluctuations, uh, these assignments matter. Uh, how much time do I have? Iqbal? Okay. So, yeah, you have 10 minutes for the talk and another five for the questions. Okay, so I still have 10 minutes. Very good. Yeah. All right, thank you. So um, now, oh, I'm sorry, something happened. Uh, let me go back. Uh, so, right. Uh, so, so I just mentioned these uh, Z2 degrees of freedom uh, that were here and um, so uh, for the root three by root three state, for example, I can have all positive uh, assignments for the uh, staggered Hamiltonian, but I have to play with these signs for the, uh, for the Hamiltonian where, um, when I say staggered, I mean the opposite signs of chiral terms on the upward and downward looking triangles. Uniform chirality case is uh, when uh, all directions are the same. I'm not sure my computer is acting up. So I... Uh, have to go back down. I'm not sure why it was the case, but uh, okay. Uh, so now there are also weather vane modes and they work exactly the same way as before. So now if you trace a line, a loop that contains the spins of only two colors, uh, you can, so now the red spins, uh, let's say are in the Z direction, which is out of plane. And you can see that the other two directions, which let's say were blue and green, you can now rotate by the arbitrary angle around those red spins that are out of plane. And so this is a weather vane mode. Uh, and the curious case is that once again, a rotation by pi would simply flip the participating Z two degrees of freedom. That particular flipping of Z two degrees of freedom can be gauged out from the semi-classical equations of motion. And so that one is actually invisible as far as the quantum mechanics is concerned. Uh, now, what about harmonic excitations? So harmonic excitations are not zero modes. Uh, they cost energy and they determine the thermal order by disorder physics. And uh, it turns out that what you can do is you can play the following game. So you look at the... Uh, weather vane modes and the weather vane modes, for example, for three by root three state would be rotations of two colored spins around each hexagon. But now of course you cannot perform three independent rotations simultaneously because here, for example, the green spin doesn't know whether it wants to be rotated around red spins or blue spins. So you run into a contradiction. Here it's the same story, but the Q equals zero state. Uh, there the weather vane modes are lines. Uh, but if you try to perform these rotations by angles alpha, beta, and gamma, it turns out that the energy that you pay is quartic, uh, but it's only quartic if you try to sort of excite incompatible weather vane modes. But now you see that the number of these uh, quadratic uh, or harmonic uh, excitations is determined by how many independent uh, weather vane modes you have. And you see that you actually have different number of independent weather vane modes. You have many more of them in the root three by root three state than for example, in the Q equals zero state. And so the prediction straight from here is that the thermal order by disorder would select the, um, the root three by root three state, even the quartic order uh, which it didn't do for the uh, Kagome Heisenberg antiferromagnet. And um, that uh, uh, physics is actually borne out, uh, but we can also ask ourselves what happens in the mixed regime. Uh, and in the mixed regime is where the interaction parameter lambda that I introduced is neither one nor zero, 
Uh, well, there is actually a nice way of connecting the uh, states uh, that are the ground states of the Cairo Hamiltonian to the states which are coplanar state by just sort of pushing on the three spins, uh, if you wish, uh, along the uh, body diagonal. And so there is a continuation in these states, which you can, uh, you know, I'm not sure this picture helps you visualize this, uh, but um, once you do this, you actually lose the Z2 degree of freedom that was only uh, characteristic of the pure Cairo Hamiltonian, because now when the spins don't make the right angle between them, if you flip two of them, you actually mess up the energetics of this. So uh, in that sense, the chiral, uh, the purely Cairo Hamiltonian is special, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, so uh, here is something interesting, and that is something interesting uh, is um, the specific heat. So that's the quote unquote experimental, numerical experimental test of whether or not you have the order by disorder physics uh, as was proposed back for the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. And now we are asking ourselves, well, uh, what happens? So first of all, let's ask also what happens uh, if you do, uh, if you look at the staggered uh, Heisenberg, uh, sorry, at the staggered chiral case. Staggered chiral case, uh, the root three by root three case, all uh, triangles can be arranged with the same positive Z2 degree of freedom. So that's all three axes look the same way on all three triangles and you can push on all of them simultaneously. And then the root three by root three state would remain a ground state throughout this regime between purely chiral, staggered chiral and the Heisenberg model. And so here you actually see the specific heat being 11 12th uh, as predicted uh, even for the pure Heisenberg case. And that's what you get here, still 11 12th. On the other hand, uh, you cannot play that game uh, if you are in the, in the um, uniform chirality case. At exactly, uh, so if, you are, if you're dealing with a purely chiral case, you can arrange, so you don't care, there is Z2 degree of freedom that allows you to fix any state you wish, including the root three by root three, but now you need to play with it, as I explained, to make all triangles happy. And so at lambda equals one, you still have the selection of root three by root three state, and so you get 11, 12 for a specific heat. On the other hand, the moment you step away, uh, you, you lose this Z2 degree of freedom. You cannot really flatten all triads of spins uh, in the same way because these triads of spins uh, for different triangles were pointing in different directions. So you cannot make it compatible. You can do it on the other hand for the Q equals zero state, but that one has fewer um, uh, weather weighing modes. And so uh, in other words, there you don't really deal with the, um, so uh, you lose the root three by root three state and your specific heat should uh, jump up. Well, it doesn't jump all the way to one uh, because uh, this Monte Carlo simulation was performed on a uh, finite size system. And so even on, on the finite size system, uh, there are still weather weighing modes uh, um, uh, for the uh, Q equals zero state. Uh, the number of them doesn't scale uh, with the size of the system. It only scales with the perimeter, but on a finite size system, the perimeter is not that small. And so it turns out that you get, uh, for the size of the system that we were looking on, you, you were supposed to get 23, 24th, and that's what you get. The funny thing is something that happens here, and that is, uh, this is, if you wish, the physics of order by disorder on steroids. So you see suddenly the specific heat is jumping and then crashing down, but it doesn't happen at one, it happens somewhere before. Uh, this is because we actually do our simulation at a finite temperature. And at a finite temperature, you, uh, since you are trying to optimize free energy and not energy, it turns out that uh, the system might prefer to actually go away from the ground state. The ground state should still be the Q equals zero state to a state where it pays more energy. That's the root three by root three state. But because of the entropy associated with the excitations, 
uh, this state still beats at even finite temperature. So uh, now I want to, uh, I'm, I'm not sure why, why I'm losing the slides again. Uh, sorry about this. I have to skip. Uh, I just want to show that the order parameters characterizing these root three and Q equals zero states actually flip at the uh, at that location of the peak. So that's kind of an interesting physics. So you you really have the thermal selection of a state of the root three by root three state. Now I want to say that in you can also check for the quantum mechanics uh, of order by disorder, and the quantum order by disorder turns out. Uh, works in exactly the same way here. I think I should skip these slides for the interests of, of, uh, of time. I should just confirm that the, um, the quantum order by disorder still selects root three by root three state. Uh, now you can ask yourself a, um, uh, so um, Iqbal, how much time do I have now? I'm probably out of time already, right? Yeah. You can still take a few minutes if you like. I mean, since we began late and there were uh, maybe a three, four minutes if you like. Okay, uh, let me try to just sketch what I was going to. So, uh, so there is something interesting that happens uh, in the quantum order by disorder. And specifically, if you look at the Q equals zero state, uh, there are many of them. As I said, there are uh, positive and negative signs that you can assign to the triangles. And as I said, they are allowed to take any loop and flip these signs, and that, would, that wouldn't change the colors. So in uh, the Q equals zero refers only to the colors and not to the signs. Uh, and so one thing you can ask yourself is, uh, so let me go back. Uh, uh, so, but that wouldn't result to the same semi-classical equations of motion. So semi-classical equations of motion uh, ask you to find the, um, the spin wave spectrum and compare uh, which of the states is selected by the zero point energy. But if you get, so every time you flip these signs, you get a new uh, set of equations of motion. Clearly you cannot um, satisfy, so clearly you cannot possibly check uh, all possible arrangements of signs because you need to numerically integrate these equations of motion and uh, uh, then integrate the, uh, the energies over the entire brilliant zone and the size of the brilliant zone depends on the periodicity of the lattice that in turn depends on which signs you uh, assign to these, um, to these colors. And so it becomes extremely unwieldy. But what you can do is you can try to test several cases and try to derive an effective quote unquote gauge theory. This is the approach that has been pioneered for the pyrochlor by uh, by late uh, Chris Henley. But the idea is as follows. So let's try to uh, imagine the following. So let's, uh, in, the, in the traditions of the gauge theory, let me go from the lattice, uh, from, the, uh, from the lattice where the spins live or other signs uh, associated with the spins live on the corners of the lattice. Let me go to a lattice where they live on the side or on the links of the lattice. So now it's a, uh, honeycomb lattice. And uh, for the honeycomb lattice, I'm just going to uh, construct it like this. And uh, I'm not sure my slides don't work well. No, this is really utterly ugly. I'm not sure. You're supposed to see only the honeycomb lattice. And that's what I see on my, let me go back up. Maybe it will clear itself. My apologies. Oh, now I'm going in the wrong direction. Yeah, okay, it works now. So now you're dealing only with the honeycomb lattice. Uh, so you have these colors and you have signs associated with these colors, plus or minus. So I'm going to, so the colors are where they are, but the signs are going to be, uh, let's say uh, a plus sign would correspond to a dashed line and a negative sign, if I decide to put minus signs would correspond to thick lines. So now it becomes these set of pictures uh, with loops on a honeycomb lattice. And I want to ask myself if I can assign certain energies to them. Remember, every time I draw a loop, I get another arrangement of signs and that results in different semi-classical equations of motion and so different spin wave spectrum. And so, for example, what's the smallest flip I can do? I can do that on a honeycomb. So how do I try to quantify this? Well, 
I will say that uh, I will introduce the notion of a flux and the flux is just the product of these uh, signs uh, which I denote as sigma zs around the, um, the plaquette of my lattice. So uh, now if I performed a single flip, that is I went from the dash to the solid lines, the flux inside that plaquette remained the same because it just seven, uh, sorry, six minus ones. But the fluxes around that are now minus ones because for each of them, there is only one thick line that is one minus sign. Uh, so this is something. So if I, so the point is that these fluxes somehow detect the fact that I try to flip something. Uh, it becomes even more interesting. If I do something that is a weather in mode, and this is a Q equals zero state we are looking at, the weather in mode corresponds to these two colors only. But you see that that line, actually, it shouldn't cost me any energy because I said that weather in modes don't cost any energy even semi-classically, but it also doesn't generate any fluxes. And in fact, if I have uh, like two long lines turning around and going back, uh, you naively uh, far away from the place where they turn, they look like weather wind modes and so, so they shouldn't cost any energy. And you see that indeed this flux only detects the, um, the energy uh, uh, associated with the sign flips locally around the place where sort of this defect is. So the defect is not a thick line, but the defect is a turn of the thick line. And so that seems to work out. And so it's naively, uh, we can expect that this flux has something to do with the energetics of my uh, quantum order by disorder. And if we try to do the same thing for the root three by root three, now flipping a single plaquette only involves two colors and that's a weather way mode. So it should cost no energy. So flipping plaquettes uh, for the root three by root three state should be free. And so it should cost no energy. So now let's try to plot, and this is the result of actually lots and lots of spin wave calculations, uh, plotted for the uh, for different states with different flux density with the flux defined as I just told you. And so you do it for Q equals zero state and for three by root three state. And you see that for three by root three state, it's completely flat because of course, flux is free as I try to explain in the root three by root three state, but it's not free in the Q equals zero state. And you see that basically you get a linear uh, dependence or almost linear dependence, depending on how much, how many fluxes you put uh, the flux density in your lattice. And you get it for both uniform and staggered state. So you can actually ask, well, where is the root three by root three state in a staggered case? Well, it's actually way below. So let me put them on the same picture. And so here is what you find. You find that, uh, so now this looks almost flat, except it's not. But here is the best ground state you get for the uh, staggered chiral state, root three by root three, then root three by root three in a uniform uh, chiral state, and then the Q equals zero states for both of them. They depend on flux, but they clearly always lose to the root three by root three states. So for both staggered and, um, and uniform case. Uh, and so, as I said, this confirms that the uh, quantum order by disorder still selects the same root three by root three state. But here is something interesting. Uh, so uh, that's the upshot of what I just said. Root three by root three state wins um, in both staggered and uniform chiral model. But here is something interesting. So here is the effective uh, uh, Hamiltonian written in terms of flux for the Q equals zero state. And as I said, it has the, uh, it has the, uh, the sort of quote unquote vertex term. And the vertex term is the term that just tells you that the signs that you, uh, you know, whether the line is thick or thin uh, should just, enforce the correct uh, uh, handedness of the three original spins around the triangle. Uh, and then there is a term that is basically because the dependence is linear, it's just 
the uh, chemical potential times the flux density. Then there might be some interaction between fluxes, but you, you know this term, of course, you expect it to exist, but it's probably very small uh, because, as I said, most of the physics that we see is described by the, uh, you know, by just this uh, chemical potential. But now let's go from this Hamiltonian, which is of course interesting to the even more interesting Hamiltonian, and that is the one for the root three by root three case. Well, now it still contains the vertex term, the term that enforces the correct handedness uh, of three original spins uh, around each triangle. But now I told you that there is no punishment for having fluxes. That's the statement that these lines are completely flat uh, in terms of the flux density. Great, so you have only one term in this effective Hamiltonian, but then you can ask yourself, well, what else you can write that would uh, be consistent with what you, uh, with the Hamiltonian we have uh, just written down, and that would be a term that would uh, perform these weather vane rotations of spins around each of the hexagons, and that is written in as the flips of these signs around each plaquette around each hexagon. Now, some of you might recognize this Hamiltonian. This is the Kitaev story code Hamiltonian. So if this term is generated, and it will be generated in some high order of perturbation theory, uh, because that's just the quantum fluctuations that flip the spins around hexagons, then suddenly you have an emergent Z2 topological theory for this emergent Z two degrees of freedom, which are just the signs that I assign to the, uh, uh, whether this, whether original spins point along positive or negative X or positive or negative Y and so on directions. And so this is really interesting. So order by disorder, quantum order by disorder in root three by root three state, uh, we strongly suspect that it, not only it stabilizes the root three by root three state, but within that state, we have a full expectation that would stabilize an emergent topological Z2, uh, oh, Z2 topological order, as in Kitaev's Toric code. And with that, I should uh, thank you for your patience and stop. So some of the conclusions you can read uh, and uh, I'll, I'll just take questions. Okay, so thanks, uh, Kirill. And we can now in, uh, have some questions from Shubro. Hi, Kirill. This is Shubro. Uh, so, um, so the uh, just the slide before this. So, do you know? Uh, I mean, what is the? Uh, how should I get an estimate of this plaquette uh, energy uh, term J of P? Well, so in principle, uh, you can do that. In so um, they haven't done this, but. Uh, you can try to do it in the, uh, uh, so we handled, uh, for, I mean, for the purpose of uh, all of these plots, what we've done is we've basically solved the um, uh, landau lifshitz equations, right? The semi-classical equations of motion, but there is another way of getting to the same end, and that is doing the one over S expansion. And in one over S expansion, uh, you can certainly generate this term, mm -hmm. do it by hand, but it's clear how that, uh, uh, will happen. So I uh, so it will appear, of course, in the so I should say in the um, in the um, uh, so uh, this requires flipping of all of six spins around the hexagon, which is I believe the third order uh, in in. Um, in the general perturbation theory. Uh, so I, once again, I haven't done it by hand. So I'm, 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 I'm um, hanging my feet here. Um, it's, so uh, that's how we can estimate the, uh, the magnitude of that term. But of course there is a sleight of hand involved in this statement, because if you honestly do that uh, uh, perturbation theory, uh, there might be other terms appearing as well. And so you have to be careful that the term that I've written down that I've postulated here is the biggest of the terms that emerge in that order of perturbation theory. Because uh, the, uh, you know, the perturbation theory might also uh, 
bring up some term that would involve in some other interactions of let's say uh, sigma z, sigma z, so on. And so uh, I we haven't done the the hard work of doing the perturbation theory. I'm just speculating what might transpire, uh, but um, you, I mean, you, you see where the caveat is, right? So uh, I know this term will appear in the perturbation theory. I cannot guarantee that it will be the biggest term that will appear in the same order of perturbation theory. I strongly suspect so, but I haven't done the, the work of proving that. Does that answer your question? Probably not to a satisfaction, but... But uh, I think this is like a good starting point. Thanks. Any more questions from the audience here? Okay. Doesn't seem to be the case. So then let's thank Kirill again for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much for bearing with me and my apologies yeah. for, the, uh, for studying slowly. Yeah, no issues. Thank you, Kirill.